Amen. Good to see everyone out tonight. Um, what a privilege and honor it is to be able to open up God's word one more time um, with you all, my family um, at Grace Bible Church. Love you. Um, for those that um, will be watching this in the future, um, you can um, actually contact myself uh, at m-i-n-s-t-e-v-e-n-c-l-o-u-g-h at gmail.com and request to be added to the list so that you can get everything you need to be a part of the live Bible study, our Zoom Thursday or Zoom Saturday. Um, again, it's a privilege to, to, to be with you all. Um, I'm glad that God has provided for us uh, a medium by which we can sit comfortably at home and we can open up our Bibles and we can and we can really fellowship with each other. We can see each other's face. We can ask questions. We can we can really um, commune with God together. And that's a that's a privilege. That's a high blessing. And we we, we don't take that lightly. Um, what, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be picking up um, picking up uh, dealing with this this uh, the idea and this concept of beholding the beauty of the only begotten son. But the topic in your outline um, is the height of assur assurance, the height of assurance. And we've been dealing with the series of assurance uh, probably since um, the beginning of, uh, you know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the Lord had, you know, put it on, on my heart to lead me in, in, in a direction where, you know, uh, because I was seeing, you know, that um, a lot of people were, um, you know, fearing what was going on and, and were struggling with, with what was going on, didn't understand what was going on. And, and really, uh, you know, some people began to question even their standing before God, their salvation. Um, there is a lot, it, you know, this pandemic has exposed a lot about us. And one of those things that it has exposed is a weakness, uh, wherever that might be. And, and so assurance, um, you know, was the predominant thing for me to actually deal with um, so that, so that, you know, people are encouraged. So people that are comforted and, and strengthened and buoyed up to persevere through these, these times, these tribulous times, this time where we are living in the midst of a plague that has broken out and is still here. Um, so, so given the dark times that we live in, um, you know, God's people need to be assured um, of our standing before him um, in order to weather this storm. Um, and, you know, I always wondered how the study was actually, um, how it was impacting people. Um, you know, the small number of people that listen to these studies. I always wondered if it is uh, making an impact on anyone's heart. And, you know, the Lord let me know that that is the case, not necessarily by someone telling me, oh, your lesson was a blessing, which is always an encouragement. But um, I, I talked to a um, uh, sister in the faith, and they were um, uh, being used by the Lord instrumentally uh, to, to talk about, um, you know, this thing called assurance, because, you know, like I said earlier, people are struggling and, and she was letting this person who was struggling with their assurance of their salvation. She was letting this person know that they can be assured you, they can find assurance, um, for their salvation in scripture. And, uh, what this, this person was struggling with, is feeling connected with God, feeling connected with God. They didn't feel connected with God, and they wanted to make sure that they didn't, they didn't suffer the eternal damnation of God. And, you know, I, what I did in response is, I did many things, but just to share with you, uh, first of all, I was encouraged, and I encouraged that person for, 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 for taking that assignment and actually taking what's being taught and applying it in an evangelical way. Um, but but I, I defined assurance, and I want you to hear how I de developed this, because I recognize that assurance is a feeling. Assurance is a feeling. It's a feeling of confidence. It is a feeling of uh, certainty. It's a, 
It's a feeling of being um, persuaded. It's a feeling of conviction, but it's not just a feeling, but you don't want to exclude that feeling. It is a feeling that is a byproduct of facts. It's a byproduct of factual, truthful promises um, and tokens of those promises that are found in the word of God. So it is a feeling, but it is a feeling attached to a reality, attached to a concrete foundation of truth and, and, and promises that, that makes a person bold, that makes a person certain, that makes a person confident about where they stand before the Lord. And if we look in ourselves, can we see assurance of our salvation? Like just, you know, it, if, if, if we were to examine ourselves, how much faith we have, or how much works we do, how much um, obedience we have, uh, how much, what, what's the, you know, how much of a measure is it when it comes to loving one another? Um, you know, can I find my assurance concretely in me and in what I do? Um, if I look, if I look in me, honestly, um, and, and I try to find my assurance in what I do, if I try to find my assurance in the level of sanctification that I have, then I'm always going to be like this. I'm always going to be have highs and lows. I'm always going to have at some point in time, I'm going to be like, yep, yep. I'm, 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 you know, I, I, I stand right before the Lord because, you know, I feel good. Right. And, and, and I'm doing good and I'm, I'm sharing the gospel. I'm reading my Bible. I'm praying. I'm doing this, that, and the other thing. And then when I crash, now I'm questioning my salvation. And so you just kind of want to think about that, um, that, that, that our, our assurance can never really be in us. The assurance of our salvation can never be in us. It must be in Christ and in Christ alone. So that's why, um, you know, uh, we, we're dealing with this, this doctrine of assurance, um, you know, is so that we can persevere and so that we can know that our assurance is in Christ and in him alone. I have, so, I have more to say about that, but I'll digress and I'll tie it all together in a moment. But also we live in a time, and I want you to know this, we live in a time where, where, we, are, um, where we are on the brink of getting our liberties taken away. Okay, we, 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 we live in a time where we're on the brink of our liberties being taken away to worship God as he ought to be worshiped in a fellowship with one another. But like, just, just, you know, think about these, these questions here. Um, what causes people? And, and I know, I know you have these questions from time to time when you actually hear either, either in our day or his, in the history past, whether it be in the scriptures among the apostles or the prophets or first century, second century, third, third century AD. Um, these questions typically take place when we contemplate ourselves in the midst of a dark and dangerous time that we find ourselves in. A question that I would ask is what causes people to ultimately suffer for Christ willingly? What, what, what causes that? What confidence does the believer have to lay down their life for Christ? These are legitimate questions. Uh, to, to be more practical to our time today, when our liberties to worship God and gather together with the saints are threatened, because we're on the brink, we're being told how to worship right now, okay? What conviction does the believer have when, what does the conviction, what conviction does the believer have to violate the government's law out of obedience to Christ and still worship in fellowship with the saints? And what I mean is when we come to that point and they, and they, and they say, you, you can't worship Jesus, you can't gather together anymore, what conviction do I have to, to buck against that in, in honor of Christ? And, what, and, and here's the answer that I have. It is the confidence, it is the certainty, it is the conviction and persuasion of who our Savior is and what he has accomplished for us and what he has promised to those of us who truly believe, which is eternal life. 
It is the assurance of our salvation that gives the, give us, that give the believer boldness to actually suffer. And if you have an assurance of your salvation, you are, you're preparing yourself to actually do that, which is counterintuitive. And that is to actually suffer for his namesake. And I, I, I'm not speaking out of my head. Second Timothy chapter one, verse 10 through 12 says this. Um, it says, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know, there's certainty, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. This is the Apostle Paul's persuasion, his confidence. It's in the ability of Christ and not in his own ability. This is why he gladly suffers and he's not ashamed to suffer for Christ. He's not ashamed of the gospel. It's because he trusts who Christ is. And what I want to say as we enter into our text is that looking to Christ by faith, beholding his beauty, his splendor, his glory is where we see, receive, and enjoy the assurance of our salvation. We, when we look to Christ, we see him for who he is, and we see our identity in him, and we see our salvation in him. We see our sufficiency and our safety and security in him. When we behold his glory, nothing else is comparable. Nothing else actually levels up. Nothing else is in the same category. Everything else actually diminishes when we behold Christ in his glory. And so in your outline, if you look at your outline here, we're in John chapter one, uh, we dealt with the privilege of beholding the glory of God for his saints. We dealt with this last week. Um, it is not for those who are willfully blind. It is, and there's a lot of people who are willfully blind today as it was in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ but it's for those who are true believers. And it is for those who have experienced the new birth, as it says here in verse 12 through 13. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And then it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. So just know that this, this privilege of beholding his glory is a privilege for the newborn believer, the believer um, who has been born again by the will of God, who is called the elect of God, chosen in him from before the foundation of the world. Point number two in your outline is where we actually left off with, and I want to um, dive into this and just pick up where we left off. Uh, we want to look at the personification of God's glory, which obviously is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we read here in verse 14, verse 14, the word of God reads, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, last week, what I, what I said was that when you think about the word being made flesh and the, the phrase, the phraseology of tabernacling among us, dwelling among us, pitching his tent among us, that should immediately cause us to think about the, 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 the history, the historical patterns that were prophetic in nature, that were typological, they were like shadows. And you know, when you think about a shadow, what you think about is that there is somebody, there's a person casting that shadow, that, there's, that the shadow means that there is a reality 
behind it. There's a reality that is coming. And so when you look at um, text in uh, uh, the text of scripture, and I'll take you to a few things, and there's some parallels that, that, that go on here. When you, when you think about Moses, and turn with me to Exodus chapter 40, I want you to see this for yourself. When you think about uh, the tent being set up and the glory of the Lord filling that tent, that is typical of the word being made flesh. And in Exodus chapter 40, I want you to see three things. You're going to see the, a, a work that is finished. And then you're going to see the glory that actually fills these, the, the, this temple, the, the, these tents, the, this tent. And then you're going to see a, a fixation um, of, you know, people fixating their eyes upon this, this glory that takes place. So look at Exodus chapter 40, look at verse 33. In verse 33, it says, and he, that is Moses, reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hanging of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. So we have a finished work here from Moses. And then we continue to read in verse 34. In verse 34, it says this. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So we see God filling this tabernacle with his glory. And look at verse 35. This is amazing. Verse 35, and Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode there and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So if, 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 you, if, if you actually develop the text carefully, you'll notice that Moses, he couldn't go into the tabernacle. The implication is that he, 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 he could go into the tabernacle and that me you know just think about it like why would moses go into the tabernacle the scriptures teach us that 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 when moses goes into the tabernacle he goes in there to talk with god god like when he goes in god will stand at the door and they will talk like face to face as, as if a friend would talk to another friend but moses wasn't able to do that work he wasn't able to do that mediation because the glory of the lord filled the place so you just have a tent that is lit up and all of the congregation is left there to watch he wasn't able to do any work this is amazing and this right here um, is typical of what we're talking about in john 1 14. but also turn with me to first king turn with me to first kings chapter 7 and 8 and i want to show you here and then we'll we'll go back to our text in first king uh chapter 7 I will, it, it, the, the same pattern is, is there. You see a work that is finished. You see God filling the tabernacle with his glory. And then you see eyes fixated upon that glory in a work that actually ceases to take place. And so in, in 1 Kings chapter 7, the last, uh, oh, hold on a second. I thought I had it. 1 Kings chapter 7. Um, starting at verse, let's look at verse 51, the last verse, it should be the last verse. It says this, so was ended all the work of the, uh, that King Solomon made for the house of the Lord. And Solomon brought in the things which David, his father had dedicated, even the silver and the gold and the vessels did he put among the treasures of the house of the Lord. And if you jump here to verse 10, you're going to see what takes place here in verse 10. Look at verse 10. It says, And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord. Verse 11. So the cloud filled the house of the Lord. In verse 11, it says, So that the priests could not stand to minister before the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled that house. So you have a finished work. You have God entering into that temple. 
Moses was a tabernacle, was, was a tent. Now we have a concrete temple and the glory of the Lord filling that temple. And the priests, the ministers were not able to do any work whatsoever. They were not able to work. They were not able to labor. They were not able to do the temple ministry. They were left to just behold this beautiful um, uh, theophany of God filling the temple and dwelling among the people and blessing the people with his gracious presence. This is what we see here. And when we think about this, we, we find the fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is amazing because I think it's prophetic to think about this too. When the glory of the Lord filled the temple and everyone had to cease from their work, that's amazing to me. When Jesus Christ assumed a human nature, that ended all of the temple ministry because he would actually fulfill everything in his life and in his death and in his resurrection for our salvation. This is amazing. That's just, a, just an aside. But that's the prophetic um, tone that we should think about. Um, but sub point A in your outline, we're dealing with the word be, became flesh, his incarnation. Um, and that's what we talked about there. We talked about the great condescension. And I don't want to get too, too much into it, but I want to I wanna talk about verse 1. Look at John 1.1, 1, 1, because we're dealing with the word. We're dealing with the word. The word was made flesh. And the word, as it says here in verse 1, in the beginning was the word. That before there was ever a beginning, the word was. This is dealing with his eternality. And then we have here, um, and the word was with God. And this is dealing with him being equal with God. This is the glory of perfect intimacy with God. And, you know, if you, if you recall John 17, verse 4 and 5, and I read that last week, and I'll just quote it for you. Um, Jesus is in his high priestly prayer. He says, uh, Lord, I, I have, uh, he says, Father, I finished the work that, that you have sent me to do. Then he says this, glorify thou me with your own self, with the glory that I had with you before the world was. This is a sharing of the glory. And that, that this verse, the, the word was with God, demonstrates that they were face to face. They were face to face. He, this word is with God, equal with God. And then the word was God. This is dealing with him, his essence, the word's essence. And so we have the divine identity of the word. But I want to just clarify some things about the word itself, the, the word etymologically, the, the, the word um, grammatically, just so that we can get a little bit of clarity about the word. And, and here's, here's something that, that, that I, would, uh, I would say, you, you can never know what's in a person's mind unless they actually revealed it with words with words. You never know what's in a person's heart unless they reveal it to you through, via words. Um, and, and when we think about the word being mentioned here, we're, th we're to think about the word as the expression of God's mind, the expression of God's mind. So just think about this. God thought about a universe. And it was through his word that th that universe was brought into existence. Th I mean, this is true when you look at here um, in verse three, all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. So we see here that the word expresses what's in the mind of God. It, ex it expresses the will of God. God thought about union with sinners. And, it, and, 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 and he brought that to pass by the word being made flesh, assuming a human nature because a body he prepared him because he did not desire sacrifices and offerings, but the, but the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ and him crucified for our sins. That was the only sacrifice that put away sins and that God accepts. But the point is, is that the word is the expression of the mind of God. But also I want to say this, that the word is the, uh, the epitome of reality according to God. And what I mean by that is truth. 
It is through the word of God that truth is manifested, is that truth is manifested, that truth is realized, okay? Um, and this is what it says in verse 14, that, that um, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. And there's so many other passages that demonstrate that Jesus Christ is in, uh, in person, the personification of truth. The reality of God is only known through his word, Jesus Christ. And then we have this, um, uh, that the word of God is the, and just get this, is the expositor. It is the explainer. It is the explanation of who God is, essentially. You cannot know who God is and what God is like apart from his word, apart from Jesus Christ. This is the point that's being made here. You cannot know who God is rightly, fully, and savingly apart from Jesus Christ. So, and, and, and it proves here at verse 18, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has exegeted him. He has declared him. He has exposited him. Um, and then uh, I'll finally say this about the word is that, um, the word is the exact expression of the substance of God. Basically, what I mean there is that the word is the image of the invisible God. You can, because God is invisible, the only way that you know he exists is by his word, okay? And the only way you will see him accurately, you, you, the only way you will know him accurately and know him savingly, the only way you'll see him as he ought to be seen in his fullness and in truth is by Jesus Christ. This is what he said. This is what he said to uh, Philip. You know, he told him, he says, uh, Philip, how long have I been with you? In John 14, he says, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is the, as Colossians chapter uh, one put it, the image of the invisible God. He is the exact representation of God. Nothing greater than that. He is the image of God. This is the word, the exact expression of the substance of who God is. He, he's the exact impression, representation. He is the ultimate radiance of the, supreme, uh, of the supreme effulgence of who God is. Okay? So this is what we mean by the, the, the word word. But when we look here in verse 14, and the word who is eternal who is equal with God and who in essence is God, the word was made flesh. We're, we're made to, to understand and comprehend this great condescension, this great condescension of God actually not just entering into covenant with, with man, but assuming a human nature, all right? Assuming a human nature, it, one that is um, infinite, actually assuming a nature that is finite. Okay, um, one who is, um, who has an inseparable, undeniable, um, perfect, harmonious um, relationship with his father, who had a glory with his father before the world ever was, and there was complete joy and complete satisfaction, he was willing to actually uh, set aside his glory um, and assume a human nature so that on the cross he would temporarily be separated for, from his father in order to bring us into that relationship between the son and the father. What a glorious condescension the son has made for you and I, uh, us sinners saved by grace. Right, and so, 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 so this 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 infinite being um, actually takes on a finite uh, nature called man. He has an intimate, unbroken relationship with God, equal with the Father, and he becomes um, a man, equal with other men, um, you know, among humanity. But the representative of man, the last Adam. In, in order to be separated from his father temporarily to reconcile us to God. And then we have God 
actually assuming a human nature. I mean, how much greater of a condescension do you, can you get other than what has happened in God coming to earth, assuming our nature? This is amazing. This is amazing. This is, this is what God in John by the spirit want us to contemplate the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory is of the only begotten of the father full of grace full of god's favor full of the unmerited and demerited favor of god and full of the reality of god he this glory is is is, is amazing and i defined glory last week as the infinite beauty and worth of God fully residing in and radiating through his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, um, just think about the term glory, and we talked about this last week. It has to do with um, that which has intrinsic and infinite worth in terms of the essence and substance of a thing. And in the, in the Old Testament, it deals with the weight. It deals with a weightiness, the word kabod. Like when you put an item on one side of the scale, you have to actually put coins on the other side of the scale to actually get the estimate worth and the estimate value of that item. And when we talk about the glory of Christ, we're talking about the estimation, the value uh, the, the worth. Uh, we're talking about, um, you know, the inestimable worth of the Son of God. And really, it's the worth of the Word, which is that He is not another God and, and not another rival God against God the Father, but He is the Son of God, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of of truth. Now let's look at point number three. This is where I want to go. This is what I want to deal with. Um, I want to I want to spend time right here in point number three, um, and maybe we'll even complete point number four. But I want to show you some things, and hopefully through this time, um, the Lord can actually um, show us a little bit, uh, a little glimpse of His glory. I'm praying that that happens. Point number three is the pattern of beholding the beauty of the Lord. The pattern of beholding the beauty of the Lord. I want to, you know, in your outline, you have this, um, you have these A's that you need to, to fill out. And I'll mention them to you now. The first A is attention. Attention by power. Um, attraction is the next A. Attraction by preaching. And the third one is admiration being persuaded. Um, so you write those down, attention, attraction, admiration. And I did that as a framework because when you look at how John constructs his gospel, you will see that he actually constructs it in a way where you actually get to see the, um, the power of the word, the power of Jesus Christ and how it, uh, it, 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 it draws people's attention. See, when we talk about beauty and we talk about glory, it's not something that you can just casually overlook, casually look away from. Like, you know, when he mentions his I am statements, it should raise an alarm. Like when Moses was in the wilderness, he saw the burning bush and he did a double take and he had to go see this burning bush because it was, it, it drew his attention and when the bush spoke, it drew, it made him attracted to it, okay, to who that person was. And then it brought him to an admiration of Yahweh, the great I am, the Lord Jesus Christ, all right? But I want you to see here that um, the pattern of beholding the beauty of the Lord as is constructed here is by two ways, by the wisdom of gospel preaching and by the witness of God's power. And I want to show you briefly a couple of things here. Turn with me to John chapter, well, learn John chapter one. Let's look at here. Look at verse 29. In verse 29, verse 29. 
in verse 29, it says this. The next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold, there's our word again, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Now, I want you to know that what, when he says that, that should draw their attention. They know something about lambs. They know something about lambs in relationship to sin and lambs in relationship to being means by which sin is removed. They understand the temple ministry. They understand the Paschal lamb. They understand, you know, that whole ceremonial law. So it should trigger them. Behold, the, they're looking at a man, but they, but, but he's, he points him out, not as literally a man, although he is, but he gives him the title, the lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. And then he says this, this is he of whom I said after me comes a man which is pre pre preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record saying, I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it abode upon him. And I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said to me, upon whom you shall see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptized with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Boom. And when he said, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world, it's drawing people's attention, drawing people's attention. And he begins to explain how he is certain that this is the son of God because of the instructions he received. It drew him. He was attracted to this person. Once he saw the spirit re re uh, coming down upon him and resting on him, he knew then this is the son of God. This is the son of God. But more convincingly turn to john chapter 6 i want you to see this this is more convincingly because it has to do with one of the i am statements and by the way um when i when i say here um that the pattern of beholding his glory is seen by the wisdom of gospel preaching what i actually uh, mean here is the seven i am statements that are made in john's gospel you know i am the bread of life um and then he said that's in john chapter 6 and then you know in john chapter 8 verse 12 he says i am the light of the world and then in john chapter 10 verse 7 through 9 he says i am the door and in john chapter 11 or john chapter 10 verse 11 through 14 he says i am the good shepherd in john 11 he says i am the light of or not the light of where i am the resurrection and the life in john 14 6 i am the way the truth and the life and in john 15 1 i am the true vine Okay, and then there's promises attached to these I am statements that are designed to be attractive only to the elect. See, beauty is not in the eye of the beholder. It is intrinsically uh, in the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. And our eyes have to be open to see his attractiveness, to see his beauty, to see his splendor, to be drawn to it, to gaze upon it, to stare at it, to be mesmerized and obsessed with it. We need, him, we need to see his glory in order to be, to, to, to be stuck on stupid with regards to the glory of Christ, all right? But in John chapter six, I want you to see people's tension drawn and and i'll just mention it here when jesus fed the five thousand, did that not draw people's attention with two pieces of fish and five loaves it drew people's attention right well look at verse 24 because they were looking for him they're like man we need to get that so jesus left uh, it says when the people therefore saw that jesus was not there neither his disciples they also took shipping and came to capernaum well, what were they doing? Seeking for Jesus. They were looking for him. And then verse 25, and when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, Rabbi, when did you come here? 
Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me, not because you saw. You see that word saw? Not because you saw the miracle. There's something to be seen in the miracle. You know what that is? His glory, <laughs> okay? His glory. But, but he said, he knew it. He said, you did not seek me because you saw the miracle, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perished, but for the meat that endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath the Father sealed. Now, what am I saying here? What is, what is John pointing out here? What is the Spirit saying in this text? The, the power of Christ drew their attention, even though they really were not necessarily attracted to what was supposed to be seen in the miracle. They just, they, their attention was grabbed. They were hooked and they were seeking after him because they wanted that power. They wanted to capitalize on it. They wanted to build businesses from it. And so just think about that for a moment. There were, their attention was drawn by that power. But now I want you to see the attractiveness here. In verse 30, look at verse 30, verse 30. It says, they said, therefore, unto him. Can you guys hear me? Can y'all hear me? Good? Okay. Um, verse 30, they said, therefore, unto him, what sign showest thou then that we may see and believe you what work are you doing? So in verse 29, look at verse 29, because they're asking this because they asked him, what must we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus says, the work of God is that you believe on him whom he has sent. And he just performed a miracle. And after he tells them, this is the work of God, believe on me. They're like, what sign do you show? <laughs> right? What sign are you? Sh show me what sign. Show me, show, show us a sign. Give us a sign. He says, show, he said, what sign do you show then that we may see and believe? What do you work? So that tells you right there, they weren't attracted to him. They're kind of like, well, we're not going to just believe on you. We need to see something. We need to see something more than what you did. We know you fed 5,000 with two pieces of fish and five loaves of bread, but we need to see more. And then look at verse 31. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. So they act like, so they're, they act like they're attracted to what he's saying to them. As he describes the true bread that comes from heaven, that comes from God, I don't think they heard him, but he said, it's not a what, it's a he. <laughs> it's he that comes down from heaven and that gives life unto the world. And they said, evermore give us this bread. And here's what he does. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never be hungry. And he who believes on me shall never be thirsty. And they're like, oh. Because guess what he says in verse 36? Look at verse 36. In verse 36, he says, But I said unto you that you have seen me and believe not. They're not attracted. The power got their attention, but they're not attracted. And later on, when he begins to talk about eating his flesh and drinking his blood in order to have eternal life, in order to be committed to him, look at here. Look at verse 66, and I'll show you the adoration, verse 66 through 69. They were not attracted, and therefore they had to walk away because they misunderstood his words. Verse 66, it says, For from that time, many disciples went back and walked no more with him. Why? 
they walk no more with him because they thought he was talking about cannibalism, but really his words were spiritual and his words were life-giving. He is the word. They just didn't understand what he was saying when he said eating and drinking. Just as what he was saying about hunger and thirst, it had to do with a spiritual hunger and a spiritual thirst, a spiritual deficiency that we have at the level of the soul that God has to illuminate our minds to see. And then on top of that, in that context to highlight and put on display the sufficiency and not only our sufficiency, but the solution to our deficiency, which is the bread of life. If we have the bread of life, we don't lack spiritual life. We don't lack e eternal life. We don't have to worry about suffering under the wrath of God and facing the second death. We can weather the storms through the physical death because we know in him we have everlasting life. This is a, look, people want to live forever, but they ain't attracted to the only person that can give you everlasting life. Christ has to be the one that we behold, that we look to, that we fixate upon, that we believe on in order for us to experience what this beauty is that is intrinsic in the nature of the Son of God. Because guess what eternal life is for you and I? Eternal life is eternal relationship and fellowship in union with God that consummates in us looking exactly like Christ forever 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 so they no longer walked with him they went back and walked no more with him then here's what jesus says because there were some that were attracted through this whole thing they weren't that their attention wasn't just draw grabbed and 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 through the preaching they, they didn't become attracted to him but they had an affection and adoration towards him and here's what we have in verse 67 and then Jesus said unto the twelve, will you also go away? Now I want you to know the glory of Christ repels and draws. The glory of Christ repels and draws. Cockroaches are repelled. Right? True elect are brought into the light. They're drawn to the light. And they're drawn not to the light, not just to it, but into the light, okay? Into the light. It's amazing. Here's what it says in verse 68. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Ask, see, look, this is, this is the thing that in the face of apostasy, which our world is in today, in the face of people walking away for, from Christ, walking away from Christ for Black Lives Matter, walking away from Christ because they're part of a Marxist system, walking away from Christ because their blackness is more important to them. And Jesus now is a white man's religion, walking away from Christ because they don't, they haven't, they're manifested to have never once seen his glory. To look beyond the man and see God in the flesh in his superlative beauty and splendor, and then realize, man, there's nowhere else for me to go. I am stuck. I am hooked. I am obsessed. I can't do anything else but look to Christ. This is what David was talking about in Psalm 27. He said in verse 4, there's one thing that I've desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold his beauty and to inquire at his temple. This is what Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we, here it is, believe and are sure. 
You know that word sure right there has to do with assurance of salvation. They have been persuaded. They are confident. They are certain that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, I want you to know that the only way that someone can come to that conclusion, like there's nowhere else to go. Like, I'm not leaving. I'm not, I'm not walking away from the Lord because there's really nowhere else to go. Like everything else is nowhere else. <laughs> okay. Like <laughs> everything else is nothing else. Everything else is nothing. Outside of Christ, you can just forget it because all this is going to perish, be fit, folded up, pass away, vanish away, corrupt out. But the one thing that's going to abide forever is Christ, is the word of God, is Christ, is his gospel and those who trust in him. But I want you to know the only way you can come to that conclusion is if Jesus chose you. So if you, if you believe the gospel, if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, if you believe that there's nowhere else to go and that he alone has the words of eternal life, then God chose you from before the foundation of the world. I'm not just saying that just to be saying it. Jesus responds to Peter here in verse 70. He says, Jesus answered them, have not I chosen you twelve? Yet one of you is the devil. And one of them is going to betray him. One of them is going to walk away. One of them is, 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 is chosen in terms of the, the office of an apostle, but not chosen as an elect in Christ before the foundation of the world. You see? And that, there's more to be had there. But I wanted you to see the attention that, that, that the power of Christ brings, the attractiveness that the preaching of Christ brings, and the adoration that is to be had by being persuaded of who Christ is. I wanted you to see that paradigm. But again, we're still on point number three. We're still on point number three. Uh, we're doing good on time. Um, I want you to see, uh, there's so much more I, I can deal with that I want to do. And I guess it's, it's a matter of a choice right now for me. Uh, turn with me to Exodus chapter 16 real quickly. Because this is just going off of this motif here, uh, this uh, saying of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ being the bread of life, being the bread of life. And I want you to see in relationship to him saying that he is the bread of life, his I am statements are designed, are specifically designed as a means by which he manifests forth his glory. Okay, and I want you to see the connection between him being the bread and the Old Testament passage that has to do with the manna. And, and I want you to see if you, you can find the word glory anywhere in relationship to the manna. All right, and I want you to look here in verses four through seven, because they had complained, they had complained against Moses um, yes, they, they complained against Moses um, and Aaron because they were hungry. And in verse 3, it says this, And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and when we did eat bread to the full. For you have brought us forth into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. Get it? Hold on. I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you. He's talking to Moses. And the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them when they will walk in my law or no. Verse five, and it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare 
that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Verse 6, look at verse 6. And Moses and Aaron said unto the children of Israel, At even, then shall you know that the Lord brought you from the land of Egypt, and in the morning, then you shall see what? The glory of the Lord. I want you to get this. There was a glory in the manna that came from heaven. And when we talk about glory, we're talking about, again, the intrinsic value and the intrinsic worth of what that manna typified. And Jesus in John chapter 6, verse 35 says, I am the bread of life. There's the glory. And God has to give us eyes to see his glory as being our sufficiency, as being our sanctification, as being the sustainer of our life as we pilgrim from this fallen world to the promised land, the celestial city, the new Jerusalem, the heavens above. Not only are we saved by the Paschal Lamb through the Red Sea, but we are sustained by the manna, and both of them point to who? Christ. It's the glory of the Son of God for us in this time. And so I want to deal with one more thing, and then I'm just going to have to shut it down. Thank you for your patience. Um, I hope that you are... Um, you are, you are uh, enjoying the word of God as we're just kind of peering into the things because we, we, we know who the scriptures are all about. Turn with me to Numbers. Turn with me to Numbers 21. Numbers 21. And then put your finger there and turn to John chapter 3, verse 14 through 16. And I want you to see something here um, as we close it out. We're going to close it out because I'm still dealing with the pattern of beholding the beauty of the Lord. Um, and in, in John chapter 3, he, Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. He's speaking to, speaking to Nicodemus, and he's letting Nicodemus know that unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You, you, so, so you could just mark verse 3 of John chapter 3 as a proof text for the, um, for the doctrine of the new birth to happen first to happen first before anyone can actually behold the glory of Christ. God has to give someone life. He has to raise them from the dead. He has to quicken them by the washing of the water of his word in order for them to be able to behold and see rightly and savingly by faith the glory of the Son. And he told Nicodemus, except you be born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. And unless you're born of water and the spirit, you can't enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Don't conflate them. Marvel not that I say unto you that you must be born again. You must be born again. Now, um, he says in verse, and this is, this is the part right here that, that, that I want you to think through with me as we close out. In John chapter 3, verse 14 through 16, in verse 14, it reads, And as Moses lifted up, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes on him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, I want you to mark a couple of things in John chapter 3, verse 14 through 16, as we contemplate Numbers 21. What Jesus did is he, and, and this, is, this, is, this is for you to, to write down and for you to take with you and appreciate what Jesus did was he affirmed the existence of Moses, that he is a real character. He is a real person that existed in time. He affirms not only his existence, but the Bible's mentioning of him. 
So you see the scripture, he, he's affirming the scriptures. He's affirming the word of God. He's affirming the existence of Moses. And in our scriptures, we have the scripture testifying of real human beings in historical past. And then not only that, but you have scripture, you have Jesus testifying of a real historical event that took place in historical past, in redemptive history. So not only is a person valid, not only is a person validated, but a actual account, a historical event is validated with that person in it. Okay, so scripture is clarifying and testifying of scripture through our Lord's uh, through our Lord's evangelical endeavor with Nicodemus, his elect. Okay, so just just mark that for a moment. He says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Now Jesus never uses fictitious um, examples to point to realities. He uses real things to point to real things. Okay, so let's let's just let's make sure that 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 we don't fall prey to to thinking that 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 the Lord just builds pie in the sky analogies that don't have any root or basis in reality to prove a truth. That, that's self-defeating that's self-defeating automatically if he would do that okay so he actually targets a real human being a mediator of the old covenant and a real event in numbers 21 to actually use as a platform to point to a real historical event that Jesus had to do that Jesus that was absolutely necessary for Jesus to perform in order for us to be saved. It validates the historical account of Jesus' life and death at Calvary's tree. It validates the theological truth that it was absolutely necessary for Jesus to die in order for us to live. All right, so I wanted you to, 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 to get that for the moment, but then I want you to get this as well. That in Numbers 21, there's a historic, that there's a context to what happened. And I, and I want you to just follow it. I'm going to mention it. I'm going to say it. There's going to be a, a lot there. You can ask questions once we cut it off, uh, or we, and, and we'll pick up where we left off next week. But, but, but the, the context, again, in Numbers 21 is uh, the people complaining in the wilderness. They're complaining. They are complaining again. We mentioned in Exodus. Exodus chapter 16, we, we read that they complained there when they were hungry. Well, right now they have food and they're still complaining. So what's the commonality between two texts? They're not grateful for God's provision. They're not grateful for God's provision and they're manifesting that they don't really believe God. They're manifesting that they don't believe God. And between num uh, Exodus 16 and number 21 is a lot of time. A lot of time has transpired, which means this. God has been long suffering. Because that wasn't the first time that they complained in Exodus 16. Er, that, 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 that wasn't the only time they complained in Exodus 16. Excuse me. And they complained all, all the way through. So right when we get to Numbers 21 and we see this horrific thing take place, know that the long suffering of the Lord has already taken place. His long suffering has already taken place. But know that there is an end to God's patience before he acts in judgment. They complain. They lied on God. Look at here in verse 4, verse 5. And the people spake, here is an explicit statement right here. They spake against God. Now, in, in our text in Exodus uh, 16, it says they spoke against Moses and Aaron. And Moses had to tell them, hey, you're speaking not against us. We're mere men. You're speaking against God. So they know in their mind now if they do that complaining again, if they're speaking against God. So the here we have it said that they speak against God and they speak against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Same complaint. They haven't learned. For there is no bread. What? Hold on, look. L listen to how, Ill how, how, how illogical this is, how self-defeating this is. They said, for there is no bread, neither is there any water, 
and our souls loathe this light bread. You see that? Whoa, wait a minute. They said there's no bread, and then they said we hate this light bread. There's no bread, but we hate this manna. We hate this light bread. They contradicted themselves. They basically said that the bread that God has provided is nothing. They didn't see his glory. They didn't see the glory of the sun. They didn't see him. And that's what people say when they despise Jesus, when they reject him, when they talk about him, when they mock him, when they walk away from him, they're saying that he's nothing. They haven't seen his glory. But look at here. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and bit the people and much people of Israel died. Now I want you to know the wages of sin is what? Death. So all we're looking at here classically is the people sinning against the Lord. Not for the first time. This is a long time coming. And then the Lord's anger kindling. And he sends them fiery serpents. And they bit them and the venom burns them and kills them. Many people are dying. Guess what? They're under the curse of God. They're under the curse of God here. And you have to take that same context in Jesus' day. And you have to take that, take that same context in our day. Especially with the COVID-19, America is under God's curse. It's under God's judgment. Isn't that right? Under God's judgment. And people are dying. People are dying in their sins. That's the worst, that's the worst death in unbelief. And people are dying in and, and, and I'll, I'll just state out the rest of the story and, and, and shut it down. They run to Moses. They run to Moses and they say, Moses, we have sinned against the Lord. We have sinned against the Lord. We have sinned for our, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. He prayed for the people. So do you know how good it is for God to judge in righteousness? Because it's designed to bring people to repentance. It's designed to bring people to a place where they're ready for a solution from God. This is, so this is necessary. And Moses prays for them. And the Lord said, take a brazen, uh, to, to, take a serpent, to take a fiery serpent and put it on a pole and lift it up. And whosoever, and I want you to get this, look here in the text, look here in the text. I want you to see this. And, and in verse eight, and the Lord spake to Moses, said to Moses, make thee a fiery serpent and set it on a pole and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bidden when he looks upon it shall live. In verse nine, and Moses made a serpent of brass and put it on a pole and it, became, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man when he, what? When he beheld, when he beheld the serpent of brass, when he gazed at the serpent of brass, he lived. He lived. Now just think about this. Think about this. Jesus said, he made it clear. And he's talking to Nicodemus. And what he's doing is he's preaching the gospel to Nicodemus. And he's showing Nicodemus his glory. That had a pattern in the Old Testament scriptures that was designed to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent. Context, in his time, the people were under a curse. In, his, in Jesus' time, people were under the curse of God. Right now, people are under the curse of God. 
Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted. When you hear that term lifted, he's not lifting himself. He's being lifted up. That whosoever, in, in this text here, it says, look or behold the serpent. Here, whosoever believes in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So what does it mean to behold the glory of the Son? Is to believe in Christ and who he is and what he has accomplished. Is to believe the gospel. It is by faith that you see Christ for who he really is. And that you're changed. You're transformed forever. Forever. He says, just as the sun was, and, and just think about this. People wonder, well, why, what does the brazen serpent on that pole have to do with Jesus Christ being lifted up? How is there a correlation between those two? Here it is. Here's the gospel truth. That brazen serpent on that pole represented the curse of God. When Jesus was lifted up, he took the curse away from us by becoming a curse for us. This is why we who believe have nothing to fear and are rescued from the wrath of God and have a secure, assured place in the family of God because he became a curse for us. Cursed is he that hangs upon the tree. The glory of this, and this is a scandalous glory. You have to, because the brazen serpent, you know, people talk about the devil all the time. <laughs> but Jesus Christ didn't become a brazen serpent. He took on the curse that we deserve. He took on our curse. He removed the wrath of God from us. He bore our sins in his body upon the tree. He absorbed God's wrath for you and me. He died. He died. And I, I asked my son, and I'm, I'm, I'm done right here. I asked my son, I asked my, my son and daughters um, during family worship the other day. I said, I said to them, I said, yeah, um, because we were dealing with this text, I said, uh, who lifted up Jesus according to John chapter 3, verse 14, 15, and 16? My son raised his hand and he said, God did. God did. I said, Amen. Amen. This is true. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We talk about God giving as being a gesture of love, providing a gift. But it's not just dealing with the fact that he gave a gift but that he delivered him up for us all, that we with him might be given freely all things. So in this time, and as I shut it down here, this is the pattern of beholding his glory. Uh, know that in this time, the only solution, as I have demonstrated, um, as we have participated and in, 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 in worked through, the only solution in our time today is legitimately the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the gospel. And what we must labor to do, we must labor to look to Christ. We must labor to point people to Christ. We must labor to point each other when we are down to Christ. Because this pandemic is going to continue. Um, and this whole uh, situation with um, 
where our government is trying to take us is going to continue. Only God can bring about a revival. Only God can actually sprinkle salt to actually put at bay the, 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 the speed of the corruption. Only God can actually give us a, a period, a parentheses period of peace before it gets really bad. He's the only one. And we're going to be tested and tried. And that's why I'm dealing with assurance. That's why I'm dealing with beholding the glory of the sun. Because, you know, there's nothing that's going to save you in the time of trouble. Not your knowledge about anything. Like, uh, I'm talking about in specific, I'm talking about secular knowledge. Secular knowledge is not going to save you in the time of calamity. Secular knowledge is not the solution. And seeing it from afar off, seeing the trouble from afar off is desire for you to spend more time being buoyed up in Christ so that like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they faced the trouble, they were ready. Right? They were ready. They were confident. They were ready to die. They were ready to lay down their life. They weren't caught up in the world. They were not caught up in the world. See, and here's the thing, and I'm gonna challenge you all. All of you that are with me right now and those that will listen later, I'm gonna challenge you. If your whole preoccupation isn't looking to Christ, something's wrong. If your focus is not beholding the glory of Christ, which is primary and exclusive, something's wrong. And I challenge you to check that, ask God's grace to help you to stop seeking for justice and stop seeking for this and seeking for that and seeking for the other thing. Look to Christ, look to Christ, because justice is going to come from him, isn't it? Restoration is going to come from him, isn't it? Glorification is going to come from him, isn't it? Salvation is going to come from him, isn't it? Judgment is going to come from him, isn't it? I can't affect any kind of real restorative and retri retribution justice or judgment down here because it's not my business. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. Right. When we look to him, we're like, you know what? The Lord will take care of this. We just need to make sure that we don't fall short. That we don't find ourselves with an evil heart of unbelief. That we don't find ourselves looking to someone else or having false idols as our security, a false security and finding that we really don't have a ground to stand on. We want to make sure that we are standing upon the solid rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'll stop there. I know I'm, I'm way overdue. Thank you for your time. Thank you for um, your patience. <clears throat> it, it, it was a privilege, again, to, to be with you and to open up God's word. Um, I have so much more to say, but, you know, I have to, I have to uh, be disciplined. And I'm not doing a good job at being disciplined with my time. So help, pray for me, pray for me. Um,